Uh, Albert Breer at the NFL owner meeting at the Breakers in Florida. A staggeringly beautiful hotel, by the way. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Jimmy, Gar- I made this argument. Jimmy Garoppolo didn't appear to have a market. I would argue this. They got him for nothing. He got him to a Super Bowl. The salary yeah. cap is way more va- – the salary space is more valuable than the draft pick is at this point. I mean, is there a market for him at all? I mean, you know, I, I think the market sort of dried up for him, Colin, because the music is starting to stop and there aren't any seats left. And so you're going to bring in a guy at that number. And this part of the problem with Baker Mayfield, too, you want him to be your starting quarterback. So, you know, the Niners were looking for a pair of second-round picks for him. They thought after the Carson Wentz trade they'd be able to get it. They wanted to wait out the Deshaun Watson trade because they hoped that that domino falling would smoke out more suitors. And as of right now, it doesn't feel like that suitor is there. Now, I, I think they want to do right by Jimmy and get him in a place where he can start. But, like, if you look at the situation they're in, right, like, really for them, it's like they could give Trey Lance two or three months because of the shoulder injury to Jimmy and see where he's at, you know, and see what an offense run by Kyle Shanahan with Trey Lance under center looks like through May and June. And then make a decision on Jimmy Garoppolo when his shoulder's health here, maybe at the end of June or beginning of July. But, you know, that's the issue is that if a team's going to bring him in, A, they're going to have to pay that money, and B, they're not going to be able to see him, see him throw until the summer. And if you're bringing in a guy as a one-year guy because he's only got a year left in his contract at that price and you don't know what he's going to look like in September or October – well, you can see why that'd be a problem for other teams. I never bought into the Baker going to the Colts because I thought post Carson Wentz, he was too toxic, and the toxicity was yeah. one of the knocks on Wentz. So Matt Ryan, who's boring and older, to me always felt like an obvious place. Yeah. How did it come down? Well, I mean, this really sort of started at the Combine. You know, the Falcons like looked at this like, we could hold on to him for one more year, but if we do that, we're kicking the can down the road. And we're really sort of delaying the rebuild that we know we need to conduct. And last year they wanted to establish culture there and they wanted to be competitive week to week. And that's why they kept Grady Jarrett on his number. Jake Matthews restructured him and brought Matt Ryan back. Now they feel like they've got that kind of fixed. They got that taken care of where the culture is in place and they can really start to retool the roster and go younger and get cheaper and set themselves up for 2023 and beyond. And so The combine, they didn't want to shop Matt Ryan. They didn't want to go back behind his back and do that. But they were able to creatively sort of value him. And coming out of there, they realized there isn't a great market for him. We might not be able to get more than a fourth-round pick. What the Deshaun Watson pursuit did for them is it smoked out interest from other teams, right? So where at the combine, they were kind of coyly asking, how would you value this player? You know, then they're getting calls on Matt Ryan because other teams see them pursuing Deshaun Watson. And that allows them to, you know, look at who would be out there they wanted to do right by Ryan and put him in a place where he wanted to go. They asked him, would Indianapolis make sense for you? They put him on a Zoom on that Saturday night. He gets on there with Frank Reich and Marcus Brady and Chris Ballard. They hit it off. And on that Sunday, they figure out, okay, like this is something that we want to happen. This is something the Colts want to happen. This is something that Matt wants to happen. And the upshot of this, if you're the Falcons, is now you go into this year's draft, you have a first-round pick, the eighth-overall pick, two second-round picks, two third-round picks, and you're going to be top three in the league in cap space going into 2023. So this is sort of that second year that Buffalo had with Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott where you've set the foundation, you're taking your medicine from a cap standpoint, and you can really come out flying in year three. Well, listen, historically, if we think it's a great quarterback draft, it isn't. And when we overlook it, it's better than we think. So there's two quarterbacks that feel like first-round picks. Malik Willis, for me, in terms of size and sort of dynamic. I mean, you can see the kid is just physically gifted. What are you hearing? Seattle's got the ninth pick, but if I'm Carolina and I'm picking whatever they pick, sixth, I'd have a hard time passing. What do you make of the the, the combine? Malik Willis, Kenny Pickett, where are we? I think Malik Willis is probably the leader in the clubhouse to be the first one to go. Um, and I think you're, you're right to point out some of the teams you did, Detroit, Seattle. I wouldn't rule out Philly. Um, you know, Carolina, of course, is in that mix. Washington could be in that mix. So, you know, I think there are some teams in the top half of the first round that could roll the dice on him. Yeah. The reason he has the edge on Kenny Pickett, Colin, and I, I think this is a fascinating trend that's happened across the NFL. Teams are looking up that mountain now 
And who do they see? Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert. And so part of it for all of these teams when they're looking at these quarterbacks is can you envision competing against those guys with the guy you're drafting? Yeah. I think with Malik Willis, you at least see the ceiling there. Yeah. You see, okay, he's not there now, but maybe he can get there over time. Whereas if you're drafting Kenny Pickett, you're relying on him maybe becoming Mac Jones. And is Mac Jones even good enough to compete with those guys? Right. So I think that that's why the, uh, those two guys probably both go in the first round. But I think teams are a little more interested right now in Malik Willis because the ceiling's there to maybe someday compete with the Herberts and Mahomes and yeah. the Allens of the NFL. So Devontae Adams signs a huge deal with the Raiders. It drives up wide receiver prices. That's probably the impetus why Tyreek Hill leaves. So Deshaun Watson in Cleveland, they give him $230 million, all guaranteed. And I think to myself, yep. I bet you the NFL owners don't love that. Yep. I mean, he, he, did he change the quarterback market? It depends. Um, you know, this happened three, four years ago with Kirk Cousins when he signed the first multi-year fully guaranteed deal in NFL history. And I remember talking to teams back then, does this change everything? And the answer I always got back was, it depends on what happens with the next guy. And I believe the next guy was Matthew Stafford. He did a conventional contract. Then it was Matt Ryan. He did a conventional contract. And so the Kirk Cousins contract kind of sat out there as this outlier. So, look, I think it's going to depend on the next three or four quarterback contracts and how hard those individual players are willing to push for the sort of structure that Deshaun Watson got. And so that puts pressure on Lamar Jackson. That puts pressure on Russell Wilson. That puts pressure next year on Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert. Do they do conventional quarterback contracts, which generally have three years guaranteed, yeah. and then a few years in the back end that are non-guaranteed, or do they push for the sort of structure Deshaun Watson got? That's how you make it the standard. That's the only way it's going to become the standard. So I think this is really going to depend on the resolve, again, of those four guys in particular, Lamar Jackson, Russell Wilson this year, and then Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert next year. Good stuff. Uh, Breakers Hotel, not like they need any business. <laughs> uh, I think it's in is it West Palm Beach or something like that? No, it's in, it's in Palm, Palm Beach proper. Okay. All right. I, I Palm get, Beach proper, yeah. I get the two confused. That's, That's where the real money is, evidently. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Albert Breer, it's great seeing you. Thanks, Albert. All right, thanks, Colin. Yeah, uh, they're also going to uh, uh, – some update on the overtime rules. I've, I've said it forever. We – we overreact on the over. We overreact to everything. I mean, at the Oscars last night, you know, like it, it was obviously inappropriate and weird and strange. And, you know, everybody gets real emotional. It's still this morning, Twitter's a buzz. Uh, the overtime rules crack me up because, um, you know, you see an overtime that doesn't go your way and everybody freaks out. And then the following weekend, you see an overtime and it works out fine. I think the NFL overtime is fine. If you want to tweak it for the playoffs, I think that's reasonable. If you look at the history of overtime in the regular season, non-playoff games, whoever wins the coin flip wins overtime about 55% of the time. Now, in the playoffs, it changes. Why? Because in the playoffs, you have the best quarterbacks. And in 2022, the best offenses. So they get the ball first, they score. Uh, so I think there's an argument to be made in the regular season. Let's just keep what we have. And then we alter stuff. For the postseason, when you have the best quarterbacks and losing the coin flip is highly punitive. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.